All right. It's April 6, 2016, and we are in Pembroke Hall on the top floor, the former library, to discuss the founding of Sojourner House 40 years ago. Sojourner House, which is um, currently, uh, as Kathy Lewis has said, a shelter for a shelter and transitional housing program for survivors of intimate partner violence. <clears throat> and uh, we have four of the original founders of Sojourner House here. And let us start by your telling us who you were then or what you were doing 40 years ago and what you're doing now. I I am Tracy Fitzpatrick. I was a student at Brown, uh, having transferred here in 1974 and graduated in 1976. Um, I was a philosophy major. And, uh, and now I have done many things in the 40 years, but currently the last 15 years, I've been a career and life coach, uh, working to support people who are making some kind of job transition, and uh, live in Boston. Great. Hello, I'm Kathy Lewis. And um, like Tracy, I didn't know you were a transfer student. I remember that you were. I was a transfer student, too. Yeah. Um, I came to Brown in 1970. I was actually accepted in 74, graduated in 76. And um, at that time, um, was working at the Dorworm Bookstore, mm -hmm. uh, which was considered a radical bookstore on Thayer Street. It's a Ben and Jerry's now. <laughs> <laughs> which ones used to be more radical than they are <laughs> currently? Right. Oh, that's a sad statement. Um, and um, I majored in journalism. It was an independent concentration. Um, and. Then went to graduate school in social work and have been a social worker really ever since. So, uh, ever since um, 1981. Right now, I'm in private practice. I see um, kids and families, and here I am. My name is Linda Kramer. I was at Brown from 1973 to 77, and I didn't fi find Brown a particularly hospitable place for me at first, and I, then I discovered women's studies and women's history, and uh, then I discovered the Socialist Feminist Caucus, and that really became my home at Brown. Um, then I majored in Amer American Civilization with a focus on women's history, and I was involved with the founding of, of Sojourner House, and my first job after I graduated from Brown was at Sojourner House. Um, I now live in West Newton, Massachusetts. I'm an older mom. I have a, I never thought about having kids. It wasn't something that was kind of part of the socialist feminist agenda. Um, <laughs> but I have a 13 and a 16 year old now. And um, I just want to note that my name is still Linda Kramer. And at my kids, when they went to private school, I noted the, the, the in the school that I was one of the few women who had kept her name. That's sort of how I looked for sort of other uh, common spirits of people, women who would, had kept their names, but there weren't very many. Um, and I'm currently a psychotherapist in private practice. I'm Christina Crosby. Uh, I was a graduate student here, and I was named Tina. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I was. I noticed that you seamlessly made the transition. I, I, about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> seamlessly, 10 minutes ago demonstrating the adaptability of feminists once again. Uh, I was a graduate student starting in English. I got here in 75 and was looking for something at Brown that was not, uh, something at Brown that was more familiar, let me put it that way. I'd come from a a lesbian feminist community in Washington, D.C., and felt rather out of place. Uh, and the Saradora Women's Center had just been opened, and I 
thought to myself, a women's center, uh, that's going to be better than The Rock, <laughs> uh, named for Mr. Rockefeller. So I went there, and there I met these people and uh, was a member of the Socialist Feminist Caucus and began thinking of myself more as a socialist feminist than as a lesbian feminist, my modifier changed. Um, and I'm very glad that the Saradoyle Women's Center was there and that these three women were there. Very good thing for me. What do you do now? I'm now a professor of English and feminist gender and sexuality studies at Wesleyan University, which is in Middletown, Connecticut. And I have been in that job since 82. Uh, went there as, I think, the first person ever hired with a job description that, that stated women's studies as a preferred mm -hmm. subfield. So I was brought in in part to work with the collective that was doing the very first versions of women's studies at mm -hmm. Wesleyan. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so if having kids wasn't part of the agenda of the Socialist Feminist Caucus, what was? <laughs> Let's start from beginnings. How did the Socialist Feminist Caucus begin? How did it get its name? When, where, who? in the fall of 75 that we started meeting at Sarah Doyle. I don't remember how we started. I was trying to remember too. I know I first got connected through, there was a class, a course in socialist feminist theory. Tish Fabens was one of the TAs and just a warm fuzzy soul, just so great. And I somehow befriended her, she befriended me and, and I got introduced that way, I think. Do you remember who taught it? Or was it an independent study course? No, it wasn't an independent study. It was listed in the curriculum. Was I remember Anne, arriving Anne from Smith Sterling? College and being shocked that, oh, I can take a course in socialist feminist theory. I don't remember that. I would have. Wow. Yeah. Anne Fausto Sterling? No? It may have been. It was a team of teachers, Mary of jo course. Bell. I don't think it was Mary Jo. Louise Lamphere? I, I know all these people. Um, I, honestly, I don't remember. I'm, I th I'm pretty sure Anne was, was one of them. And uh, somehow then hearing about both the Sarah Doyle Center, because I was new to campus, and it was new that year, yeah. and the Socialist Feminist Caucus. But I, you said that, that you had met previously before the center even opened. Right. Yeah, we that, met before. That, I remember we met before the center opened. What's that story? I forget. We were meeting somewhere. On Waterman that? Street. Yeah, there, Waterman Street. That's yes, right. uh, either 96 or 196 Waterman Street. But there was a campus strike. Do you guys remember? That was in the strike? spring of well, 75. That, that was 75. That was, yeah. And we, we participated as a group, but we had already formed. Yeah. And then as a group, we supported the strike. Yeah. What was the strike uh, about? Um, it had to do with um, uh, how the corporation was allocating. Um, assistance money to students, and it was disproportionately impacting students of color, and it was huge. And the university was shut down for about a week. It, uh, yeah, students, students of color took yeah. over the uni university hall. This is in like April 75, yeah. something like that. We walked and, around. And, and, and many around. students, and white students walked around that building. We walked around mm -hmm. that building many times, <laughs> day and night, in support to kind of buffer any reaction that might come. And uh, there was also over admissions policies and the establishment of the Third World Center. Yeah. And um, I don't know if, I tried to remember if Sarah Doyle Center funding was one of the issues, but I don't think so. And I think we kind of kicked ourselves for missing that opportunity. But. but I think that was the point at which class and race and gender were folding into each other. And as a, as a feminist organization, we started to think, well, wait a minute. There's, there's more here that we need to, to figure out and be good at. So. 
Now, what kind of an organization was it? How many people uh, were there, and uh, what did you do when you got together? We read. We read. We read. What we, we, we read. Study group. Yeah, it was a study, study group. group. It yeah. wasn't a fanc sanctioned um, student organization. Right. It was informal. Once yeah. a week. Yeah, I think we met once a week. We read. We read. We read um, women wages for housework. Right. Um, right. Oh yeah, lots of good stuff. There's lots of good stuff. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah. And how long before you began focusing in on what was then called battered women? Well, it wasn't even called battered women. That's right. Beating, the, beating your wife is what it was called. Or, that's right. You know, um, I mean, I remember the so-called joke from basketball games back when I was uh, going as a kid to the games at Juniata College in central Pennsylvania. Hey ref, when did you stop beating your wife? That was the that mm. the taunt the refs. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a joke. It was mm -hmm. a joke. I think we first started. I, my guess is it was around the fall of '75. Is my best guess that we started to think about what uh, what we could do in the real world. We didn't have the issue yet. And you brought the I had to been it. I had been working starting that fall, one day a week at Rhode Island Legal Services because uh, I was thinking about whether or not I wanted to go to law school and I thought that was a good way to, to see, and so every Friday I would head down the hill and work there and I got assigned to do some studying some tallying of temporary restraining orders. And. Uh, these guys, Kathy helped me remember the name, but I got assigned to work with Janice Salinger, who was a paralegal at Legal Services, and she began to put this sort of tallying task I had in context, telling me about the, um, the huge caseload they had of women coming in who were either frightened of their husbands at minimum, and, and it turned out about half of whom had been physically Battered, and I began to learn about this um, this issue, and pretty, and at the, simultaneously, we were sort of as a group talking about let's make our study, let's bring our study into something real. And one day, sitting in the Sarah Doyle living room, I said, "Well, I'm learning about this problem. You wouldn't believe what happened. You know what happens, and the cruelty, and the horror, and the fact that women have no place to go." and that this is an unspoken problem. And even the lawyers, the police, the court systems, the, you know, the systems that are supposed to be there um, to help and support women in this situation have no idea how to do that or certainly or, you know, don't, or don't much care to, right. Um, and so I spoke that out loud at one point. And, uh, well, I don't remember what happened. I mean, do you remember what happened? Your jaws dropped. Yeah. I mean, I, my jaws have been dropping every Friday, you know, <laughs> and in between, just learning about this. But um, the group quick, pretty quickly coalesced around, around it, and we came up with a strategy that we would do some research and document what was happening, and that as students, we were particularly equipped to do that, but also to just kind of name the problem and understand the problem before you decide what kind of strategy there should be to address the problem. We ought to start with understanding it. There was a guy at URI, Richard Gellis, Gellis. Richard right. Gellis who was one of the few people in the country who had started thinking and writing about domestic That's violence. That's right. One of us spoke with him. I don't know. Yeah. Is that you, Kathy? Did you speak with him? Or it it might have been. <laughs> it was How did you find him? I don't remember. Well, we, be, we began to rely, I remember we relied a lot on Janice and her colleagues at Rhode Island Legal Service. Janice Service. Gilligan. Janice, oh. Janet, wasn't it Gilligan? Salinger? It, it, Janice she Salinger was, another was the paralegal. The paralegal, and there were. Janet was the lawyer. And they wanted to stay kind of under the radar in terms of being publicly, you know, if you read the article, which I just recently reread, they're not even named, but I remember they guided us to, they knew obviously a lot about the issue, working with women every day, and they guided us to some sources and connected us with family court mm -hmm. and uh, mental health services, and we did a pretty extensive job yeah. interviewing. 
So Richard Gellis was working on it. Who else? I mean, and when was it somebody named? Somebody in Great Britain. There was somebody, a, a yeah. man, also a man. What was his name? A guy in Great Britain who wrote a yeah. book about domestic violence. And there was, the yeah, and there was an effort in, in Boston. They yeah. had begun to start yeah. the same. They were about a, maybe a year or two ahead of us yeah. in terms of so the opening. House. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just As barely a, a year ahead of us. Right, yeah. so, so they, we quickly connected. And these, the women in, in Boston, to my recollection, were uh, actually sheltering women in their homes, yeah. uh, bringing people and their kids back to their apartments because there was no else to go. Yeah. Right? Betsy, what was her name? The, Betsy, yeah. the sense of danger in which these women lived was very vivid. Uh, and we firmly believe following Tea House that when, it was not, I think, any longer if, when we opened the shelter, and we didn't know when that would be, but when we did, it would have to be with an unpublicized address and that we would use their methods for getting the word out and for getting women to the shelter. So we would meet people at a Dunkin' Donuts on this corner or that corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we would not give out the address. What? I guess I, f I want to ask first, so when did people start saying battered women? Because first it was a sojourner house for battered women. So, you know, as Christina said, the, the term wasn't even invented. And I mean, one of the things that I think is so extraordinary about um, what the feminists were doing is bringing this to people's attention, giving it a name, making it emerge as a, an identifiable problem that could be dealt with. So, who and where and when did battered women come up? I mean, how did it come up? Don't remember. That. Don't remember. I don't know. All right, that's a project it, for some yeah, student. And it it yeah. sort of felt like a movement thing. It that, was a movement yeah, thing. That was the beginning. What was exciting is that we were, I mean, it was a sad movement, but it was also very exciting to be at the beginning of a movement. Absolutely. And Kathy and I and Donna Pilkington went to Washington, D.C. in 1977, I believe, or um, in the winter, at the first national meeting of people working uh, against domestic violence. And there we were, and this, you know, people from all over the but country. But do you remember what the convention was called? It wasn't called domestic violence, right? I think battered women had yeah. existed, um, but as a legal term or as a technical term? I'm not sure term? it was a legal term. I Look think, here. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that um, as it was becoming, and it may have been Richard Gellis, for all I know, who, who coined it. Mm -hmm. um, who was the guy in New Hampshire? There's another um, sociologist in New Hampshire who was also, was also writing about it. I um, can't remember the name. But there was some academic work that was starting to be done studying what was considered a phenomenon of domestic violence. And, um, and women were considered victims. And as victims, they were named battered women. And I think that's how the terminology okay. started to emerge. So we're, let us try to remember to um, talk later about the transition to domestic violence, to, to violence against women, to domestic violence, to intimate partner violence. Which, mm -hmm. um, and then also, of course, we want to talk about victims. We're going we're gonna to get to that. But what's fresh fruit? Tell us about so, fresh fruit and the pieces that you people apparently wrote on this question and published in Fresh Fruit in those very early days. Yeah, so, so we, it, this was early. It was fall probably of 75 where we identified this, this issue. We wanted to learn more about it. And so we set upon doing that. And we divided up. There's actually, we have copies that we'll you know, leave with the archives. Um, of a three-part series. March 76. What is Fresh Fruit? It's, this was an alternative, it says Rhode Island's Alternative Weekly, and it was published uh, as a free paper, kind of pre-Boston Phoenix, or, or around the time Boston Phoenix. This was the Providence version of it. Um, Kathy had, had been freelancing there and knew of it. We had, we had wanted to do research, but we didn't want to do an academic paper. We wanted to, we wanted to help raise the issue right. in the public mind. And so we divvied up the research. All these people were talking about um, interviewing legal services, going to speak with mental health 
professionals in different social service agencies, mm -hmm. talking to folks at family court. We interviewed police, you know, members of the police department. It's a pretty extensive, having reread it recently, I was blown away how extensive it is. Um, it was a three-part series um, over, you know, sort of a month and a half that appeared in the paper. And, and I think it did a couple things. One, it, it certainly did raise the issue. Not only in, because I, as I remember, Providence Journal picked up a piece, which I, it'd be interesting to go look for the archives of that too, afterwards, and it began, sort of began a conversation. But also I think even in the research phase, as we pulled, you know, we sort of, we identified the resources in the area and began to pull them together and tell them about other conversations we were having and, I, you know, I look back on it and think, well, it was also kind of a, a, a networking, even though Absolutely. we weren't conscious of that at the time, it was kind of a networking project that laid the groundwork for what you guys went off to do, you know, in the next steps. Um, I don't know, other thoughts on, on writing the piece? You actually wrote collectively? Well, that was, I remember the process of writing, because we each did our own research, and then th three of us, I think, wrote pieces of the article. We had an outline sort of in vision. And then we handed it over to Kathy, who was the journalist. The journalism major. I remember, <laughs> I remember um, my piece was very much like a research paper. And when I reread it as the Fresh Fruit article, I thought, wow, she really does know what she's doing. She made this a into a piece of journalism. I think you gave me, give me more credit than well, I do. This I is think very this was really good stuff. Yeah, well, we, we uh, there were, there were 12 people named, and I'm happy to read the list, of, of who did pieces of the research. And then I think there were three drafters, and then Kathy pulled it together into the... Do we want the uh, list read out for the purposes the of the oral of history? I don't know. Um, or we can provide it later. It's Eileen Birkin, Kate Crosby, Tina Crosby, no relation, but uh, Lisa Edmond, Tish, Tish Fabens, Tracy Fitzpatrick, Laura Gang, Ann Kaplan, Linda Kramer, Carla Jimenez, and Kathy Lewis, and M Mimi Plevin. Oh, great. I got the That's names. great. And do you remember um, what kinds of reaction you got to the pieces? I mean, d d were, were people interested, indifferent, hostile, uh, any kind of responses that you got from the public? I'm not sure I remember specific responses, but I think what it did, it served as a springboard for us to do community work. And I think that was really key from, from my recollection, key to our work was that we really, as a to identify as a socialist feminist caucus, we didn't really want to be an academic-based entity. We really felt, given the, the issues that we were discussing, we felt motivated to act. Great, so what was your next step? We Linda. opened a hotline. We started a hotline. How remember, did you do that? I remember planning the training, and Carrie Jacobson, I believe, ran the training, but we all, I remember putting together the pieces of the training, and I have a copy of the training manual, which I'm happy to hand over, and we set up a hotline where women could call, I believe, 24-7 who were feeling afraid, and we didn't have, a, unfortunately, we didn't have a shelter yet, so I honestly don't remember what we did for the women who actually called. A lot, well, some of it, at least, was listening and taking seriously what they were telling us. Uh, so that part of what we learned was restating uh, in affirmative language what we had just heard. So I hear you telling me that your husband is threatening you and you're really scared and you want to figure out what you can do and, and you're afraid he's going to take the kids and you just don't know where you're going to get housing. And then the woman would say, yeah, because when you're in danger, you go back over the problem recursively. You just need to say it again. So I remember the frustration of not having resources to offer. It was a real frustration. I want to keep, keep you on the basics. Where was the Where phone? Was <laughs> Where yeah. was the hotline? Who, who was the group that Two came Stimson together? Street. Right across the street from uh, Wheeler School. 
We, so there was a room? We subletted from the um, American Friends Service Committee. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And how did you get the um, funds to do the subletting? Fundraising. And how yeah. did you raise the funds? Oh, we had potlucks. We did and stuff in church basements. We. Do you remember what the rent was a month? Oh, I, the American Friends Service Committee was very generous. They may have like charged us, you know, pretty pretty much Jerry nothing. Jerry and Jerry Elmer and Carol Bragg. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, and then and you just, had, I'm sorry. At this point, it wasn't just students, right? Right. And after the article, we opened weren't there it up. some yeah. members of the community Absolutely. and from Rhode Island Legal Services? So it became sort of a community, community student based. group. Yeah. Um, because so there, were, there were feminist organizations in Providence. Uh, Ann Fosto Sterling was a member of the Women's Liberation Asian, Union, yeah. I think it was called. Yep. Uh, so there was a, you, you know, the, 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 Social movements then really did see themselves as part of what was sometimes simply called the movement with a capital right. M. And the reason I, wa I, I, I keep wanting to focus on the nitty gritty is because there are generations of people who never lived through social movements yeah. mm -hmm. and really would love to know how do you start something right. like this. So you, 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 you get a phone, you had to pay for rent and a phone, right? And we had to learn how to we had to figure out who could train us. And then how did you find out the, the, the training protocols? I think we developed it that the, those of us, a small group of people, developed a training, probably called on different resources. Something else that happened around the same time is that we discovered that there was another group in Providence that was starting a shelter. And they were, is this too soon to bring them up? The women's, it was called the Women's Center. And I, the reason I think it's really interesting is because it clarified our identity as a feminist, progressive, radical feminist organization. Because the Women's Center was opening a shelter for women as well. But they were older, they were more conventional, they were less progressive. They were professionals. They yeah. were, they were, many of them were, were social workers. And they were we, terribly threatened by us. Yeah, they were really, <laughs> it was very, that was, it, it was hard. They were unhappy with us, and, and we were unhappy with them. Yeah. Uh, it was one of those moments of great feminist solidarity. Yes. Um, well, it was the ragtag lesbians who were going into the uh, more conventional, professional, somewhat feminist group that had already established itself. And actually, the, the, the big split was over the issue of whether or not the address would be publicized. Yeah. And they Confidentiality. were very much about, no, it has to be a public address. And, we thought, you're crazy. Why would you publicize an address when women are trying to escape from extremely violent partners? So there was a time when we were thinking of doing this together? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't remember that. Oh, yeah. No, it was. It, there, I think that we not only believed that it needed to be a confidential address because women were actually in danger, but we had an entirely different model for speaking with one another. We worked collectively. And that was simply not, that their, their organization was not based on, on those principles. And we had a vision of ending domestic violence. That was the vision. Exactly. It wasn't just, I mean, we really thought a lot about how we differentiated ourselves. And one way was that they're providing a social service. Right. And we wanted to offer some sort of revolutionary potential or hope. And you know, I, long since I've understood that matters are considerably more complicated than that, uh, and that the kinds of splits that we experienced at that point, some of it was simply older and younger, mm -hmm. uh, and and some of it was were was truly about political principle, and some of it was about uh, just style. I, I think our socialist feminist beginnings were really an important part of that, that we had spent a year reading about socialist feminism, and that's where we were coming from. That's the kind of thinking, a kind of empowerment, the kind of class analysis that we brought that the Women's Center didn't bring. I remember when we were writing the article, making, um, weaving in issues about power and money, um, and, and really trying to explicitly address those so that it wasn't just, you know, a social service program. It right. was also about access to jobs and economic opportunities mm -hmm. and wages, you know, for housework and things like that that would 
that would actually empower all women, not just women who are in, in situations of domestic violence. So it was, it was really the context in which we thought. And change the relation of public and private. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I, that I learned that really matters as much now as it did then is that private homes can be very, very dangerous places for women and children. And the home was understood as a place of refuge, not of danger. And it still is. And that, I think, to me, is perhaps the most lasting political revelation of that movement. And also the notion of, vict of victimization, the, the blaming the victim. That, that was another piece of our research, is that we really came to understand that women don't cause the violence, that, uh, that um, violence happens as a part of a power d dynamic in a relationship, and I, I felt like that was an important part of what we were, um, when, we were when we would talk in the community, we would talk about what is domestic violence and what, what enables it to happen. And um, one of the things that, was, uh, that we, we did as a group is we would go out in the community after we finished writing the article, we did community mm -hmm. education. A lot and, of it. And I remember I was 21 or 22 years old and I was going out to speak to police departments and mental health agencies and um, schools and it was just amazing to feel like we, had, we could go and talk to a group of people and we had learned in that year of, of our research a, a lot more than other, anybody else knew about what happened, what was going on. With what kind of response did you get? Very, very good response. People asked questions. People were concerned. I felt like I remember getting, feeling very empowered by those talks and feeling like we were really reaching people. Do you remember how those were set up? How did I think we, we had a speaker's bureau. We initiated so it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also remember some oh. resistance. Do you? Okay. Yeah, and, and I remember um, things like, um, well, if he hit her, she must have deserved it. Right. Or if she hasn't left, that's her problem. That was the big one. Well, if she's so afra afraid, why doesn't she just leave? Mm -hmm. Right. And the notion that the man controlled, that, that when women were threatened in this way, it was a, it was a matter of, of, of a system of control. It was not just about the, physical, the, viol the threat of physical violence. It was that the men were controlling the women and the children mm -hmm and that they controlled their access to the public world. Mm -hmm. And uh, having a hotline, I mean, we learned so much just by listening about what we believed needed to be done. We were able to get some attorneys who were, did pro bono work for women to get them restraining orders. Yeah. And I think that was one of the, uh, part of our first step into actually providing what would be considered a service. But I think, once again, it was in the context of movement work. It was, yes, we, we wanted to end domestic violence. And we thought that if we join forces and um, form coalitions, that, yeah, it's, it's within our reach. I think we were naive, but I think but We were okay. hopeful. <laughs> what I remember was that was so striking about Sojourner that the organizational model and the vision mirrored the goal. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you had, and perhaps this is unfair to the Women's Center, but on the one hand, you had a social service organization that <coughs> serviced victims. On the other hand, you had a socialist feminist organization that enabled people and helped people figure out how to move on. So can you talk more about the, is that fair? I mean, would you? Uh, I, I, think that that, I think that that's accurate to the vision that we had. I believe that matters were more complicated than that, but I believe also that we did have that vision and that, that the big, Dif one of the big differences in the models was that we imagined, once again, this was our hope, that women could come through the shelter and then return to the shelter as volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't call ourselves volunteers. I mean, we understood it somehow differently. It wasn't, it, you know, volunteering just has the, has the taste of, I don't know, I'm a privileged person and I have extra time and I'm mm -hmm. volunteering. 
It so, was more so what about how you envisioned the structure, the, the, the consensus, non-hierarchical, mm -hmm. um, who does what, um, what are the relationships among the people who are staying there and the people who are, who are helping them, and that's not the right word, I know, enabling their uh, transition and so forth. H how about having some details about how you set it up? We, we called ourselves a collective, and that was an important part of our identity and also of how we operated. We made decisions collectively. We had a committee structure. We had a board of directors. We did establish a board of directors. We established ourselves as a 501c3, as a nonprofit organization, and we made decisions collectively, which meant we spent a lot of time in meetings <laughs> making decisions. I also th look back, I mean, you know, at that point I wasn't that involved, but thinking about Socialist Feminist Caucus, we were a pretty homogenous group, yes, you were. know, and, uh, yes. and I mean, relatively in the world. And, you know, I think that, that played an impact, that had an impact too. So I was going to ask, who's the we? Yeah, yeah. Brown students, a lot of, um, uh, brown students be were interested in the work that we did, as well as a number of women from the community. Do you remember Judith Clem? Yeah. Um, yeah. There were there were some older women from the community who uh, learned about the project and and became part of the collective. And there were also students from other uh, colleges in the area uh, who who were part of the operation. So we did quickly move literally off campus, even yeah. if it was mm -hmm. just across the street. Uh, being off campus, I think, mattered. Yeah. Uh, it's also, I think, crucial to underline your observation, Tracy, that we were a homogenous group, which means that organizing collectively and deciding through consensus was much easier than it would have been if we had been in a truly a more broadly based community group that just would have been a lot harder. Right, so at the beginning when we were talking about the socialist feminist part, um, um, you mentioned um, class and race. So was this pretty much a middle class white group? Yeah, pretty much a middle class white group. I think, I think for me at least, socialist was aspirational. Mm -hmm. it, it, it also announced uh, a vision beyond the individual. And although I didn't have then an analysis of what I would now call possessive individualism, where we each somehow own ourselves, uh, we understood that we were talking about a broad-based problem and that we needed to have some sense of ourselves other than individuals joining together to do this. Some, when you call yourself a collective, at least in my recollection, is that there's more of a sense of possibility. It seems more open, even though perhaps the, the decision-making structure actually made us more closed, but it, it seemed more open, at least to me. It's an interesting to think about leadership, too, and the, you know, it's, I, I can't remember that we had a leader. We didn't have a leader. And, uh, you know, and thinking back on it now, it, you know, each one of us made, you know, our contributions for sure, but, you know, no one of us can say, oh, we led this effort, you know, and there's, there's a certain a beauty in that looking back on it and maybe a naivete, naivete but we did it. You know, it worked well, it, for a while anyway. We did and we didn't. We, we, had, we, we came upon some organizational stumbles, which I yeah. have uh, Later recorded on. in some of the meet, minutes of meetings where we were trying to grapple with some problems, some internal problems around leadership and decision making. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we called on the services of an organizational consultant, somebody named Jeannie Newman. Remember? Oh, Jeannie I do. Newman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> who specialized sure. in, who knew a lot about uh, progressive organizations and sort of the culture of, of progressive organizations and the kind of trouble that can happen when leadership goes unnamed and when it's explicit 
when it's stated that um, there's no leadership, but implicitly there is leadership. And I think that what, so we actually hired Jeannie to come in and to work with us and to help us evaluate our organizational structure and to figure out a more effective way to work together moving forward. I don't remember a lot of the details, but I do remember that I learned that there is leadership and leadership yeah. needs to be more explicit. Now, Kathy, in a lot of ways, really was the leader of the organization. Kathy was the heart and soul of Sojourner House in many ways. She was sort of, mm, she I don't know that I agree with that. Um, well, when, let, was let, it, when was this? Because I think there's an evolution here that yeah. you're capturing that's, that's important. Kathy and I, in 1977, were the first two full-time paid staffers. Right. Yeah, House. and that's right. crucial. We got CETA money in 1977. We, uh, would you help people understand what CETA? ETA, Comprehensive Com Employment Training, Training Act. Act. So the federal government gave our organization money to hire people to work in progressive and nonprofit organizations to, f to, f to um, effectively train people for later employment. Uh, and I, I always understood that our securing of that funding was a kind of, um, Real action where we you know, went in to get what we could, that we were not exactly using the money in the way that uh, the, the, the formal language surrounding it might have envisioned that it be used in order to pay right. for right. the and work that, that had to be done. And that's when we had to navigate those tricky bureaucratic um, conventions about, okay, here we are, a collective organization and people expected us to behave like a regular 501c3 which was hierarchical and right, had, a, right. had yeah. a director, board of directors, etc. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember and I just sort of reflecting back on the glue that held us together was really sort of the, the holding true the concept of, of how is power understood and used and the hope that yes, that one day we, the privileged white women, could step back and those who use the services would in fact take over the organization. I think that was really, as my memory serves me, was, was part of the goal, was that we would in some ways lay the foundation, but it, it, it wasn't our issue. It was an issue that we wanted power to be afforded to those who were struggling mostly with the issue. Um, and I think that's where we learned how difficult that was, particularly when we started the shelter. Now, where did the difficulty come from? Because one could say it was either too optimistic, uh, pie in the sky idea, that wouldn't be my uh, interpretation. Some people might say that. The, uh, some others might say it was simply the strain on, on continuing to get funding between a radical non-hierarchical organization on the one hand and these you know, establishment funding sources on the other, or some combination of both, or those two things plus other things. So I mean, how, how do you feel uh, you know, the, the, the gradual change of Sojourner House went? I mean, what, how did that work? I think that it's very hard to remember how little that we knew. <laughs> it's not hard for me to remember. Well, we knew very little. We knew very little. <laughs> I mean, I didn't understand the basic principle that a foundation would not want to give you money unless they already saw something in place, that there needed to be an institution that had the capacity, in the view of the funders, to use the money effectively and that they weren't just going to be funding in some sort of stream. I didn't understand the difference between soft money and hard money. I mean, I barely knew what a 501 blah, 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 blah was. <laughs> I remember I mean, us I, learning that. Yeah, yeah. and it was, it, the, all, it, it was all, at every point, it was a revelation. And uh, I, I think when you're learning that way, you're able to do so much because you don't know what you're not supposed to be able to accomplish. And then you do run up, though, against the things you don't know. And I, th I think, too, for me, one of the biggest revelations, as well as 
running into sort of those structural um, bureaucratic things was the cultural stuff. And I remember when we first opened the shelter and we were working with four women of color, um, Hispanic women, African American women. Um, we were different worlds. We understood the issue from sort of, uh, I'll say academic. We were, we were becoming more familiar as we worked more with community organizations. But it wasn't until we started working with women and their kids, and at any given moment in the shelter, there were more children than adults. We started to understand, oh, OK, this is their world. This isn't our world. And I think that was for us, for, at least for me, the, 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 the more difficult thing to bridge, because I realized how uninformed I was as a person about poverty, about racism. I, I read about it. I studied it. I talked about it. But I think for me, the, the real crucible was being in the shelter and, and working with women. And I remember, <laughs> um, it seems petty, but it was so informative to me that women in the shelter would have arguments about what food they would eat. And they would criticize each other's food. And I thought, what is this about? I mean, this, we're in a situation where your lives are at risk and we're having arguments about food. And I realized this is symbolic. This is about cultural difference that just because you're providing a service doesn't mean that you're bridging these incredible cultural gaps. And so, for me, that was, OK, where do we go from here now? And who are we, the white middle class women, who are providing a service, but do we really know what we're doing here? I didn't mean that to be a conversation Did the, No, <laughs> I, I was giving you time to respond if you wanted to. Uh, did the Women's Center know what it was doing in that context? I don't think so, because I didn't think they thought about it in that way. I, Do you think the experience of the residents of the Women's Center was different? I don't know. I, I can't speak to that. In other words, what I'm asking is, was the social service model right all along? Well, to <laughs> some degree, yes, it was. But the vision, I think it's really important to to remember that we were trying to do more than simply provide a shelter because we continued our educational programming. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, it was very important to us that we continue to talk in the community at every point that we could, it, we, we talked in schools, we talked to social work organizations that met, you know, maybe twice a year. Uh, we talked, I think we continued speaking with uh, healthcare workers, uh, it, we really believed in education. And I don't remember when we started realizing that, that, that Sojourner House needed to be providing something or trying to provide something for the men who were violent. Mm -hmm. And that, that we needed, if we believed that we were trying to end domestic violence, then we needed to have a way of addressing everybody who was involved in the violence, and that included the men. And I think, to, to my mind, that is one of the most striking points of differentiation with uh, what, what, again, in my mind, I don't know what the Women's Center was, but in my mind, they were providing a service to women and children who needed shelter for whatever reason. Uh, you know, what I remember is that they were working with Traveler's Aid, mm -hmm. so that women who were stranded at the bus station because they couldn't get the fare to continue would be welcome there. And we just saw that as a very, very different kind of problem than the problem of systematic domestic violence in which uh, the heavy hand is exercised as part of a systemic exercise of power. So ed educating was a big commitment that we made. We had a slideshow. It was the, it was the cutting edge of technology. It really was. 
It was a slideshow with uh, some sort of automatic dinging, forwarding thing. <laughs> we were high tech. We were yeah. high tech. It was high tech. Yeah, we I did mean, all that research without the internet. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's it's. But but we 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 believed that we had to have these educational commitments, and maybe because I ended up becoming a teacher, becoming an educator, I that's the what, that's part of it that I remember most vividly because I think I felt that that was a place that I could contribute most fully. Uh, and, and that was different. How do you, what do you think about the enabled component? Um, to what extent um, were, your, were your goals of empowering the women filled, fulfilled? Um, how successful were you? Um, clearly, they didn't need education about their situation, but they did need certain skills or certain resources of empowerment so as not to necessarily, so as to be able to, to move on. I think that's a really good question, and I think if we were doing it again, we would have included some kind of research component to to know more about how the impact of what we did on the women who we served. But I, did we do, did we keep any track of any? Evaluative. Yeah, I don't no. believe so. I personally went on to, I moved to Boston and became the director of a transitional housing program for two years in um, Mat uh, Mattapan, Massachusetts. It was called um, Horizon House. And it was a sort of a model that grew out of the battered women movement that was um, where women went, were able to live there with their children, and they were required to be in a school program during the day. Um, so it sort of took another step, and, and, and women could live there for a, for a longer period of time so that they could be involved in training. Um, what were the... Big, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, big picture, I can't speak to the specific women in that era, but big picture, the impact has been tremendous. You know, again, our small little you know, stone that rippled out in the, in the big pond of domestic violence. But, um, you know, I went to the hospital yesterday for a medical test, and I got asked whether I feel safe at home. That never happened then, I can assure you. And I don't know when it began exactly. Education and, we certainly and can't outreach. Take responsibility. <laughs> what? Right, I said education and outreach. Yeah, that's but, the, but the, the issue, I mean, you know, the director of, of the existing Sojourner House is sitting here next to us you know, having served 50,000 or more people over the years. So, did, I mean, I, somehow we, somehow we had a, a, a tiny part in that, but um, how you know, the it mattered. It mattered. What we did mattered. How the organization made the transition from what we had aspired to when we began to being an organization that understood that it needed to secure contracts if it was going to have any kind of stable funding flow. Uh, and have a structure. And have a structure. I mean, there are moments of recalibration that happen. And by 82, I was away from Providence and not going to meetings every Tuesday night. <laughs> uh, and I don't. I honestly don't know what that moment of history is to, that, that, that went from this, these truly aspirational beginnings we've been so animatedly talking about to being something that is an organization that can survive and thrive. Uh, for 40 years. For 40 years. But to do that, it had to transform itself. Mm -hmm. And I was no longer part of the we that was doing that transformation. So I feel my, my, my memory is really yeah. just, I just come up against a barrier. I don't know how it happened. And I think that that might have been the, I was going to say, maybe those were the hardest years. I don't know. Uh, but transforming from something where you believed you were part of a revolutionary movement that could end domestic violence to being the organization that needed to have a hierarchical structure and needed to have stable funding flows, that's a big transition. 
And I'm very, very glad that the organization was able to make it because right. we wouldn't be here 40 years later celebrating the fact that Sojourner House, with the same logo <laughs> of the rising sun. I want to ask Kathy, do you have um, comments on that transition period when Christina said she was gone in 82? Um, you, were, you were certainly around. Um, Sojourn House almost didn't make it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was because of that decision that had to be made. Are we going to stick to principles of being a collective, modeling the power structure that we felt addressed most directly the issue of violence against women? Or do we say, in order to survive, in order to be a service, in order to have a resource for women and their children, do we cross the Rubicon? And now we are a traditional hierarchical um, organization that can present itself to foundations and other funding sources as credible, um, as responsible in their eyes. Um, nobody knew what a collective was. Nobody could fathom what that right. decision-making structure entailed. So there was that time. There was was there an moment. actual meeting? that you remember when the vote, was, the I collective, was, yeah. not, excuse me, the collective decided we're crossing the Rubicon? It was contentious. I wasn't there, but I, I knew about it. And it was, it was heartrending because um, there were, um, emotions were high. It's like, are, you know, are, are we selling our soul? It's the so, early 80s. You remember when? Yeah, was it was the early, early 80s. 80s. And when was the Council on Domestic Violence formed? That was also the early 80s. And what was the relationship of that to s the shelters? Um, it was originally the Council on Domestic Violence, and it became the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, because by that time, there were five shelters in the state. And the collective wisdom at that point was that, let's not work against each other, folks. Let's get together. Let's develop a, um, a coherent presence up at the state house. Let's lobby for specific protective legislation. Let's do collaborative educational outreach. So it had a, it developed separately, but we were very aware of what was going on with Sojourner House's transition. It occurs to me that, that there are two um, nitty gritty um, facts that we, we didn't discuss it about the beginnings. One, the name, mm -hmm. when you all chose it. And two, your first building. Um, maybe you could give us some information about those two things. Mm -hmm. No. The name. No, you go. I don't remember the specifics, so. I remember the meeting. The meeting? Tell we us. We were about sitting it. in the Sarah Doyle yeah. Center in the living room. Do you remember Betty yeah. Brooks? Yes. Yeah. Betty Brooks was a paralegal at Rhode Island Legal Services, and by that time, um, the organization had expanded to include many women from the community. And we were thinking, OK, we're going to become an, some sort of entity in the community. Let's mm -hmm. give ourselves a name. And Betty Brooks said, let's honor Sojourner Truth. And let's call ourselves Sojourner House. The idea that you could, if you had, if you had people helping you, you could leave terribly dangerous and oppressive conditions. That was the connection with Sojourner Truth. Mm -hmm. The Underground Railroad. Yeah. And the meaning of the word sojourn. Sojourn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sojourn. I, I remember feeling like, ah, oh, this is it. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember who designed that logo, but it, who, who did that logo? Yeah, who did the Could logo? Laura the Laura house with the, with the sun. I, I bet it was Laura Golly. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Say the name loud and clear. Laura Golly. She was a local artist. I have a, media, a memo here from January 1981, which said that there were serious problems concerning Sojourner House have come to a head. And as a result, five members of the collective have declared a work stoppage. Mm. Remember that? Mm. No, I wasn't around then. Wow. But what, what I do? <laughs> what, what was that over? You're bringing it to light. I mean, you're, you're, you're providing detail. I have, what is that document? 
it was a, a letter from, remember Betsy Wallace? Yeah, she Betsy had a Wallace, really, that's She who had a really her. good head on her shoulder. She yeah. worked for a local social service agency, and she just was a really smart, down-to-earth woman, and she took some leadership, and as that's a reason, I was trying to three yeah. meetings were organized to address the work stoppage. A board meeting, a staff meeting, and a decision-making session. And um, so. So the first building? Mm-hmm. I don't know, I, I feel even weird saying the street it was on. Because yeah. we're so committed to it not to, being, to see not, it's not the, the shelter anymore, I assume. Oh, no. 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 Long since. No. Uh -huh. Right. But it was in Providence. I can't even say <laughs> yeah, it. It was in Providence. <laughs> it was an apartment in Providence. Yeah. Well, it was a it house. house. It was a house in Providence house. that had a secret address, that had a secret address that we rented, not as ourselves. And we, and we spent hours and how did you, hours how, scraping the lead paint. Who rent? I mean, who what rented? was the fictional entity that rented it? People, persons, yeah, individual. Just yeah. You just invented a name. And we, oh, no. Even the utilities, we wouldn't put in the name of Sojourner House. We put it in individual names. I see. So everything was in a person's name. It wasn't in the the organizational. Did we think about insurance? Did we think about liability? Did we think about the fact that we could be sued <laughs> and go to jail for the rest of our lives? No. Just you didn't have insurance. Hallelujah. No. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. Did we have insurance? But you had to have insurance if you bought a house. Well, maybe we had insurance. You, you bought it. No, you no, rented no. it. We rented it. You rented it, it. of we course. How would you buy it? Of course. Yeah. Right. Of course. And how, how did you make the money keep coming to pay the rent every month? Well, that was the big problem. <laughs> I mean, that was where we began to understand the difference between, well, the, where I began to understand, I shouldn't say we in this context, I began to understand the difference between soft and hard money. And, and foundation money, and being able to misappropriate funds from the federal government to do things they weren't intended to do, like the CETA grant. Hey, everybody, everybody I know, abused I CETA. Know, I know, I know. VISTA grants eventually. CETA, well. VISTA, yes, yeah. they and were wonderful. You know, I learned, I learned at that point, I learned that it really, really, truly, absolutely does matter whether you elect a Republican or a Democrat. Did I think that Ronald Reagan could, elected, uh, could get elected? It seemed, it seemed, it seemed ludicrous to me, and, and in some ways it still does seem ludicrous to me. But that fact is that he was elected, and those services were cut mm -hmm. immediately. Legal services. Immediately. The cuts came in immediately, and it really forced the issue. But you never lost the house, did you? Yes. yes. You did yes. lose it. It, it. There was a time when the shelter stopped functioning um, and there were safe houses. There was a safe house network because we couldn't afford the rent anymore. So it was back to the safe house model um, until um, I think it was the United Way finally got on board. The Ro United Way, the Rhode Island Foundation, Heavy hitters. Rhode Island Foundation had already funded us a little bit, but that's when I learned that they're not going to keep giving you money right. unless you can demonstrate that there's an institution in place that can actually use the resources to continue. Because they couldn't fund us as a foundation. They couldn't provide our funding stream. I had funding stream. What did that mean? I didn't know these words. I remember that the United Way funded the Women's Center. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where the real struggle was when we were competing with the Women's Center right. for money. And they were, they, they funded, the women, United Way funded the Women's Center. And I didn't remember that they then started to fund I, us. Maybe they didn't fund us. But we were, we were getting, they, I, I, I have this recollection. And by this time, I think I, I was out of the actual workings of the collective as it made the transition to a different kind of structure. But I remember United Way fu uh, funding coming in and thinking, this may survive. But I was, not, I was not there during the really, really hard time of getting from, we started with safe, we didn't even start with safe houses. We started with hotline. We opened a shelter. We lost the shelter. Now, I can't even use the word we. Sojourner House lost the shelter. Sojourner House is still an organization. And then Sojourner House somehow managed to recover. And whoever did that time of recovery, I honor them. Because that must Truly. have been very, very hard work. While you had the original house, um, how many um, 
parents and children could you have in that house at one time? Depending on how many kids came along. I seem to remember, and this is, I'm pulling this out of my head, um, five women and their kids. So there might have been 10 kids in the house, 12 kids in the house, and five women in the house. But I might be making that up. I would have said three women and their kids. Could the kids go outside? How, how could people, um, it was a secret address for good reason. Um, how did people maintain their safety when they were residents? They sort of basically stayed in the house? No, they could come and go. They went to work and things like were, that? Yeah, or? I mean, the kids went to school. Yeah. Uh, the kids went to school. Women and children went in and out. We who worked there went in and out. and. Who knows when the person who owned the house figured out that they were not renting to an individual. Oh, he knew from the beginning. He knew, he knew from yeah, the start. He was actually a very supportive man. There you go. Well, yeah. good job, Kathy. <laughs> so it, 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 I guess I'm asking, it stayed <laughs> safe. You didn't have any horrible... Well, you know what the interesting thing was? We found out within a couple of weeks that everybody knew where we was, where we were. <laughs> the police knew. Yeah, because... That's just the way the network works in Rhode Island, is that but the batterers to, didn't the know. The batterers, by and large, didn't know unless they knew people. Um, but we know, but I, do not, knew I do right not away. remember a violent man showing so, up. Yeah, we were very lucky in that regard. And that's just plain old luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we were nervous about that. And in fact, we, um, we closed off one window on the, on the front porch because you could easily walk through that window and right into the house. Um, there were some other precautions I think we took too. I think I never really slept when I did an overnight sleep, an overnight shift because I was constantly <laughs> listening for noise, worrying that was somebody going to try to get into the was house. Was there because just there one were, staff person along with the mothers and children? I think nights, we, there was one staff person. One staff person. But there were reports of shelters in other communities where the, um, the violent men found the shelter and they would break into the shelter. So it was not unheard of that that would happen. And I remember that another resource was finding people to, to do the work, to yep. work at the shelter, and that every time we did a training, we would publicize it in the community, at the universities. And it was always amazing. We got every, every time a, a long list of people who wanted to volunteer, who went through the trainings. It was a very um, generous uh, response. Among others, Brown students continued, didn't they, very over the years so. to, uh, yeah, to and work? We, we did a lot of meetings at the Fox Point Daycare Center which happened That's to right. be on the Brown campus, yeah. but was not a, right. really a that. Brown institution. But the woman, B, somebody who, B, what was B's last name? B, um, she was lovely, and she let us use her space. And so we, a lot of the time on the weekends, we had trainings and meetings there. It was our space on, um, uh, was very small. We couldn't do meetings there. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts about the, change in terms from battered women, violence against women, domestic violence, intimate partnership violence? Well, yeah, I have some thoughts. Uh, I believe that intimate partner violence, even though it's much more cumbersome in the mouth, is actually more descriptive uh, of what, of, of how we understand, of how the problem can be understood now. So I'm thinking two things simultaneously. One, saying intimate partner violence strips it of its systemic, uh, the, the, the critique of a systemic power. Uh, it's no longer a, 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 a group of people and a group of people. Some, you know, the men having more power than the women. Intimate partner violence does name the fact that Men can beat up their, their boyfriends. Women can beat up their girlfriends. Uh, brothers can beat up their sisters. Sons can beat up their mothers, can and do. And so calling it intimate partner names a truth about the private space. What it doesn't name is a truth about 
the way in which the private space is part of a public space. And that's, that's what gets lost in that, uh, that development of the name in that direction. Thank you, Christina. I feel well, like your, that yeah. response was very much part of what you provided us. As you're, you were, Christina was one of the older members of the original collective and had a very uh, away with words that you still have. And uh, uh, so that's why I like being on the education committee. <laughs> it's well put. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I ha always think about um, um, Wendy Brown's book, States of Injury, uh, Wendy Brown being a political theorist, and she wrote a book a number of years ago called States of Injury, where she talks about the really rather rapid change in this country from uh, the 60s when everyone was up against the wall, motherfucker, you know, figuring out how to keep the state off your back to the, certainly by the 80s, when um, people were declaring injury and looking to the state to address the injury. And certainly, um, I was enjoying reading, uh, rereading a thesis by Emma Kuby, um, an undergraduate who wrote um, an honors thesis in, in 2003. Um, for the gender uh, studies concentration entitled Feminist Campus Politics and Violence Against Women, a study in the history of student activism against domestic violence and rape at Brown University, 1976 to 1994. And the difference between Sojourner and the Socialist Feminist Caucus on the one hand and the date rape people on the other was very extreme. And I think, I think that we, and Emma, did a wonderful analytic job, it seems to me, of looking at historically how things have changed. But I just wonder um, what you, as veterans of the Socialist Feminist Caucus, think about the politics of victimization today, which seem to be quite alive and well. At the same time, what you think about other changes that are happening, like Black Lives Matter, like Bernie Sanders' socialism. He's made the word acceptable again. God knows. I can remember when, we, when people were afraid to declare themselves as liberals, let alone as socialists. So I was just wondering if you wanted to step back a little bit and, or step forward a little bit and reflect from the present um, what you think about some of these things, um, given your experience. Well, when the Occupy movement began uh, a number of years ago, and I, th I, I remembered our days of, of collective action because I think they were trying very much to discover and experiment with a, new, a different model of organization. And, you know, it was interesting. It echoed some of the same frustrations we, we were talking about, which, and some of the learning curve that Sojourner House had to travel, um, you know, with, with just a, a, a vision that was very broad and egalitarian, um, bumping up against the reality that sometimes somebody has to make a decision and you have to prioritize things. And, you know, so um, anyway, I, I mean, I don't have any particular insight or suggestion to offer as a result of our experience other than to note that those issues, are, I think, are, are are still being, you know, are still evolving and still there as, as fodder for all of our imaginations and efforts. I think that it's very difficult to uh, comment on those sorts of changes within the, within feminism broadly or within the movement against domestic violence in particular without contextualizing them in the extraordinary shift uh, in the country as a whole from the, in some ways, truly um, uh, well, the rebellions, I won't call them a revolution, but the rebellions of the 60s and then with the 
I think, the ethos of, of collective uh, possibility being alive and, 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 and alive and alivening through the 70s. And the fact that I couldn't imagine that Ronald Reagan would get elected <laughs> demonstrates something about my political naivete. Uh, and the sense of possibility that was lost as the country shifted, its institutions shifted powerfully to the right. I mean, it was a powerful shift to the right. It was not just some sort of recalibration toward the center. And it shut down ways of thinking. It just shut down ways of thinking. And I think that that was particularly true off campus. And I stayed on campus. You have to remember, I'm a professor. And so, I had, in some ways, unhindered access to whatever uh, radical thinking was able to be nonetheless sheltered within basically the places that you could do work that was not government or corporate work, and that would be the church or the campus. Those were the two locations where you could continue to think what might be called radical thoughts. So the fact that Feminists shifted toward uh, a model in which they, in which they, we would turn to the powers that be for aid and comfort uh, does not surprise me. Because after all, the country elected Ronald Reagan the president. And so I can be, I can be as testy as the next person about the politics of resentment in which you turn to the very authorities who you should be while I'm using the should, uh, that I would wish that one would be critical of, you turn to those authorities because they have resources. But in a turning to those authorities for resources, you begin to moderate your, your vision, and it changes what, it changes the actual statements that you can make. You can no longer make the same sort of political sentence happen, like we are a collective who works by consensus. I'm a part of a group now that's working on issues of racial justice in the context of a faith-based organization that I'm a part of, a, a Jewish congregation. And it feels really good to be doing activist work again. Um, and as part of this group, we read the book, The New Jim Crow. And it was written in, in just in the last year or two. And I was really struck with my naivete about racial oppression in the 70s, that the new Jim Crow is about what was happening to African Americans in the 70s. Right. And we had a pretty, I thought, a pretty impressive analysis at the time, a class analysis and a feminist analysis. But I don't think we really brought in the racial piece very, very well. And I, so as I was reading The New Jim Crow, I felt really like, wow, I, I'm really learning something from reading this book. And as somebody who considers myself somebody sort of well-schooled in radical thought, I was kind of humbled by the fact that I really did not understand the way in which racial oppression, the form it had taken um, after the Civil Rights Movement. So that's kind of, um, so I'm, I'm involved in the work now in sort of the, in this group and trying to find our way as a group of white folks of, of how we want uh, working on what it means to be white and live with white privilege and what does it mean to be allies um, color and um, so we're kind of stumbling and um, there's several people in the group who like me were involved in activism in the 70s and it's really nice to, because I feel like we're coming from a different place than people from a, a, a slightly younger generation who kind of weren't part of the radical radical movements but who are more sort of want to do good in the world but I feel like there's you know something that we share for those of us who are involved in, in a, a real more radical perspective but kind of like the question you asked well what difference did it really make that we were a socialist feminist organization at Sojourner House where's the beef like was there something different that we we did uh, where's the eggplant <laughs> <laughs> tofu <laughs> well oh, go ahead the, the uh, i think
think that that Tracy, toward the beginning of our conversation here, really named it that we helped to make domestic violence, violence against women, uh, a category that had a name and that we could talk about, and and that 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 that. that 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 babe, it's consciousness raising mm -hmm. is what it's called, and it's consciousness raising uh, on a collective, not an individual scale. But I do think it is consciousness raising, and the fact that that there were enough shelters that there needed to be a coalition where there could actually be a a, a, a functioning network of shelters within a matter, with, within less than a decade, mm -hmm. is remarkable. It means that we weren't the only people in Rhode Island who were thinking these thoughts. It means that each one of those places has their history and that they could have their oral history if they had Brown's resources to gather such an oral history. It's out there, that history, still. So it was an, it was a, what we did was part of something that was happening nationwide. Yeah, I, I'll echo that, Christina. Um, we didn't figure out how to build the movement. We didn't figure out how to end domestic violence. We didn't figure out how to restructure organizations to a more collective egalitarian. And we certainly didn't solve the problems of race, class, or, or sexism, you know. Um, and I don't know that anybody ever, anywhere has figured those things out. If they have, please send me that book. <laughs> but, um, but I think in, with all our naivete and with all our, um, our need to learn, um, we, we did something that matters. And as, as all those other people you were talking about and as you know, when you think of social movements, maybe maybe that's what it boils down to, is that we, you know, you do your thing, the thing that can be done, that, that you know, even if, even if you're naive to think that it can be done, but you make the attempt, you make the effort, you build something, um, you do it with good intention and good faith, you make lots of mistakes, and you hope that, that some lasting impact is there. And, you know, I think there were certain smart things we did. I think doing some research and really understanding the issue was just a really, that, that gave you the basis to go then build something because you had a, an awareness of the problem. We had an awareness of the problem. I say you because I wasn't so involved in that phase. Um, I think we built community. Um, we not only here amongst ourselves, but extending out in that networking I, we were talking about before. We, um, and, you know, we were intent on actually um, creating an institution that, you know, not just talking about it. Um, I don't know what else you'd add to that list of a few things that we did right, but... I, to made be, it possible for me to be yeah, a graduate even student. Even though none of the none of the big answer, none of the big questions are resolved, none of them. Kathy, what thoughts do you have on on? Well, I, I'm appreciating what Christina and Linda and Tracy are saying because um, it's it's um, it's difficult, particularly now, given how fractious and in some ways it feels almost perilous our political environment. Sorry, um, and I, I try to connect it to where we were at when we were thinking about Sojourner House and how we were moved by a sense of personal and political outrage that the private space was a space of horror and, and an entrapment for too many women and what is wrong with that? How come you can't feel safe in your own home? And understanding that capitalism is not a fair system, that no matter how hard you work, it doesn't mean you're going to succeed. In fact, sometimes no matter how hard you work, you're never going to get out of a, a financial hole because 
the game is rigged against you and how racism impacts so many people in ways that are so subtle and so difficult as a white person for, to understand that all these things were sort of coming to a very sharp focus in a way that made us challenge our own personal politics, that made us think about, okay, what kinds of decisions are we making with our lives that have an impact? And is it the impact we want? And so I think the message I take from all of that work, and like the work you're doing around a community effort to, to struggle with this stuff in ways that probably aren't comfortable, in ways that make you feel like, OK, I'm not sure I'm on solid ground here. But you push yourself anyway, because you believe that at the end of that, there is something better. And yeah, I mean, I, I look at the 2016 election, and <laughs> I'm like, where are we going? But we think Reagan was bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> stay tuned. Um, and I, and I don't want to get into that too much, because that will end on a really negative, negative note. note. <laughs> um, but I think it's, you know, we said the, the personal is political, mm -hmm. and the political is personal. And my hope is that future feminists who look at this history and, and evaluate our experience can take away, like, OK, if you believe that you can make things better, Try to figure out the best way to do it. Um, I believe you do it better as a group than you do as an individual. Um, I think you have more power in a group. But figure out the way that you can do it best and commit to it, even if you think you're being naive. Because sometimes being naive actually helps you. Right. <laughs> Occupy, it's in some ways, is a, is a helpful um, comparison because Occupy was not an organization that could make any kind of transition into uh, a group that would propose, let, let alone enact policy. And yet Occupy gave us the 99% as a phrase. Mm -hmm. And that phrase is a very powerful phrase to name something very fundamental about in the, the way in which some people have gotten rich as other people have not uh, in a, it, it, systematically. Uh, so there were many things that Occupy wasn't, but there was also the important thing that Occupy was. It was a collective action, and it was a collective action that, that articulated a new understanding of the political world that we live in. And. Um, I think on a more personal level, as Kathy was saying about um, at a, one of those over 60 moments, where <laughs> <laughs> we're all 60 now, yeah, we're. Um, that, that the personal, that our, my experience with Sojourner House, I feel like was probably the formative experience of my young adulthood, and that it has been carried with me in everything I have done ever mm -hmm. since, and that I hope that in my work with the racial justice work, that that is a piece that the, the intelligence, the emotional intelligence, the social intelligence mm -hmm. that we brought to the work at Sojourner House is now something that's kind of, I hope that I bring to my work with my congregation, with my racial justice work, with my kids, with my work as a psychotherapist, that it's a part of, it's a very integral part of who I am and how I think about the world and that I feel like I, I have always brought with me. And being here today is, is kind of reminding me of that, but I don't think it ever went away. But I think that um, we're kind of being reminded of, of how formative those years were. Um, they were just amazing. It was just very amazing to be part of this, this group. Amazing seems like, a good, uh, seems like a good word to end on, unless you people have other thoughts you'd like to pursue. Well, I'd, I'd just like to thank the Pembroke Project and yep. the, you know, those of you who care to record this story. Um, I, it's ve I very much appreciate that. And I 
do think there are lessons, you know, hopefully we are at the stage where you want to sort of leave some lessons behind so that people <laughs> don't have to start from scratch and, and uh, you know, to the extent that this may be a, a useful story. Well, Thank the Pembroke so Center built on the kind of work that the Socialist Feminist Caucus started. So I think it's a continuum. I think the circle goes around, and that's, yeah. that's a nice thing. Much appreciative. So, thank so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, okay. how about, you want to hear the song? <laughs> Kathy, can I sing the song? <laughs> S-O-J-O-U, wait. S-O-G-O-U-R-N, E-R spell Sojourner House, Journer House, that's where women go when they are battered, battered, being there for them has really mattered, mattered, C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-V-E, -L -L -E -E. that's the way that we may make decisions every day, collectivity for, for me. me. <laughs>